Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you both for being here and for your service to our country. Uh, Madam Secretary, there has always uh, been an effort to take care to keep a bright line between our military and partisan political activity. Recently read an article by uh, General Milley, he talked about some of the challenges in the military today, and one of them was the politicization of the military ranks. Is this a problem, a challenge? And if so, what are you doing about it? Senator Durbin, I, I think it's absolutely essential that the U.S. Army remain apolitical. Uh, you know, Americans of, of all political persuasions have to be able to look to the Army and feel confident that it is apolitical and that it will follow the lawful orders of the commander-in-chief. So I, I do think we have to be concerned about that. Uh, I, I get concerned when I see the Army uh, sometimes being put into a position where it becomes a political football. Uh, I think, you know, we, the chief and I do everything possible to try to avoid that. Uh, we, have, we have reminded all of our soldiers, you know, that they are not to engage in political activities, wearing their uniforms, for example. So it is something we try to uh, reinforce all the time that we must remain apolitical. Glad to hear that. Let me mention to you, you talked about industrialization. I just want to put a plug in for the Rock Island Arsenal and the depots and arsenals across the United States that have risen to the challenge time and again. And I hope you'll make them part of your thinking about future demands for uh, developing high quality uh, materials and equipment. We are, we are very much factoring in our arsenals into our organic industrial base plan and I'm actually planning to get up to Rock Island uh, in early June, I believe. Good, glad to hear that. General, um, you're watching this war unfold in Ukraine as we all are. And uh, we were told at the beginning, before the Russians initiated their advancement into Ukraine itself, that our experts thought it was likely to be three days before Kyiv fell and three weeks before most of Ukraine fell to the Russians and we would have a multi-year resistance effort that followed. That didn't happen. Kyiv is still uh, standing, and thank goodness the government is still in place, and most of the efforts uh, by the Russians have not commanded territory to this day except for the Far East. So what lessons do you learn as a professional in the Army uh, observing this in terms of the efforts by the Ukrainians, and I guess especially what have you learned about the Russian capacity to fight a war? Well, Senator, one of my biggest takeaways as I take a look at what's happening is this, this idea of leadership and this idea of will. And if you take a look at, you know, what a lot of people do when they do analysis, they'll take a look at the Russian army. They'll say they have very good capability. They have very new good equipment. They have so much of it. And when they look at um, the Ukrainians, they say, hey, this is a much bigger country than Ukraine has much more equipment. But there's that, that, that idea of leadership, and I th the fact that the um, president of Ukraine stayed and said he was going to lead uh, from that country, the fact that the will of the people, everyone stayed and fought, that, that is in, in a, like almost the secret sauce of every military. And very, very important to have cohesive teams uh, that stay and fight. And sometimes that's hard to measure, but we're seeing the importance of that right now in Ukraine. They stayed to fight, and, and it's making a difference. So if the projections and an initial timetable turned out to be wrong because of the factors that you just mentioned, could you speak to the equipment and capacity of the Russians in the field in terms of uh, their fighting capacity and uh, in terms of our need for preparing for the eventuality of defending against that? Well, we'll take a look at what the Ukrainians are asking for. Um, they, they certainly want artillery. The, the, the Russians actually use artillery very, very effective. They fight with fires. They haven't been very effective um, with their uh, ground maneuver forces, mainly because they're fighting tanks without infantry. They're not doing combined arms operations. And so when we take a look at what we need in an army, we can take a look at what the Ukrainians are asking for. They want long-range fires. They do want armor capability. They want air and missile defense. They've been very, very effective uh, with the javelins. They want counter fire radars that can determine uh, where 
the, the Russians' artillery is, and they're putting that together with training and will, and that's why they're having the success they're having. And let's not forget logistics. Very, very important. If I could ask one last question. Madam Secretary, I am all in when it comes to standing behind the Ukrainians, and I've made that well known to my colleagues. I think it's heartening that it's such a bipartisan feeling on Capitol Hill, and that's almost a rarity, but it is happening. In terms of our capacity and the equipment that we have warehoused and available and in, in production, are we being pushed to a limit where we have to reconsider uh, any aspects of our own defense and how much is being allocated? At this time, Senator, I mean, certainly we keep a close eye on, you know, what our minimum requirements are. And as requests from the Ukrainian military have come in, we have factored that into our analysis. But at this time, I'm not aware of us uh, being unable to provide a particular type of assistance to the Ukrainians because we felt like it would it would jeopardize our readiness. Now, I do think, you know, we are we are working with industry to try to help them be able to ramp up production so that we can continue as it looks like this is going to be a rather protracted conflict. We do need to uh, do everything we can, I think, to be able to continue to provide assistance to the Ukrainians while making sure that we have the stockpiles we need. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Senator Blunt. Uh, thank you, Chairman. Uh, Secretary, last week at the hearing, uh, Secretary Austin stated that we would replace our munitions sent to Ukraine in the span of one year. Doesn't look like to me, from looking at that a little further, that's likely to be possible. I think the javelins probably closer to 18 to 24 months, and the Stinger missiles, we haven't bought a Stinger missile, according to the CEO of Raytheon, for 18 years. Uh, talk to me a little about whether you think uh, that one year is possible, and if not, our efforts, how important it is that we get our stockpile of those two weapons at least back to where they were before the war began. Senator, I think, you know, uh, the timelines for replenishment vary depending on what the systems are. Uh, you are right that we have not had an open production line for Stinger for some time. Uh, we do still have some missiles, some Stinger missiles that we can provide, but there is an obsolete part that we're going to have to figure out how to work around. You know, do we design around that or uh, bring forward sort of a next generation Stinger? And I think that will take a little more time. And to your point, yes, I do think on the Javelins, uh, I think Raytheon is trying to really accelerate, you know, whether they can come inside of a one-year period, I am not sure. I think it may take a little more time. But uh, we are trying to work aggressively with industry in and both you're, cases. And you're committed to replace those stockpiles, at, at least to, to the level that they were at. And there may be some congressional discussion about moving higher than the past level. We certainly want to make sure that we continue to have our at least our minimum requirements. So, yes, I think we want to replenish and continue to be able to provide to the Ukrainians. And, uh, General McConville, you're, the Army's uh, reluctantly, I think, requesting a reduced end strength uh, in this budget because of uh, recruiting. How's that going to affect a, a basic training post like Fort Leonard Wood in Missouri? Well, I think what we'll see, Senator, is we'll have less young men and women coming through training. Uh, we see as a uh, momentary uh, pause, and, and when we say recruiting, we're talking a couple of thousand that's spread out uh, around a couple of posts. So I get you the exact numbers, but it might be a, a couple hundred less coming through training. But we're hoping uh, with a call to service, we're going to see young men and women that want to come back uh, into the service, and, and we need to do that. Yeah, well, I hope so, too, and we'll, we'll be watching that. The Defense Department, you know, this budget was really produced before the Russian invasion of Ukraine, uh, before you got the FY22 bill on and on research and uh, development. Uh, the Defense Department in the transition material said the highest research and development number we've ever asked for. And then you got a higher number than that in the 22 budget, which I hope we match that number and exceed it. But what, what are we what are we learning from what's going on in Ukraine right now in terms of our weapon systems, the the, the way that uh, even a land war like this is being fought differently? I think, General, I'll go to you first on that. 
Well, Senator, what, what, what we're learning is uh, at least we're, we're reinforcing uh, confidence in where we're going uh, with our research development in, in our future weapons systems. We, you know, we believe if we had the, you know, us or, or our allies and partners have, have the long-range precision fires in place that we're developing, they would be very, very effective against the Russians because they would be able to take their artillery out, they'd be able to take their command control po posts out. We think that the ship sinking capability is great to have. That deters any type of amphibious operations that uh, a, a future adversary may want to do. We think where we're going with air and missile defense, and especially our focus on countering unmanned aerial systems, is going to provide some, some great capabilities that we're going to need to have to deter uh, future adversaries, our, our long-range uh, aircraft. Uh, when we look at the speed, the range, and the convergence of the future battlefield, we feel very, very comfortable with them. So we're, as we look at each system, we're, we're weighing that on how that work in either in Ukraine or against a more sophisticated adversary, and we feel we're going in the right direction. Well, and I, th I think looking at what's happened with drones and other things that haven't been uh, in warfare before, I think we knew there were some we weaknesses of the, the Russian tanks, but I don't think we anticipated quite how vulnerable they have turned out to be. So this is an important time for us to think about what uh, what our structure should look like. And Secretary, as uh, Vice Chairman Shelby said, you know, the the fact that the 22 budget was bigger than you would have expected, maybe when you submitted this, the inflation number is way off. And I think we're all looking at our weapon systems, as General McConville just mentioned, in a different way. Uh, I'd expect this is going to be a very vigorous discussion with the committee and the chairman and vice chairman as to what this budget needs to look like differently than maybe we would have thought in March of this year. And I look forward to working with you on that. And you too, Chairman. Senator Schatz. Thank you, Chairman, uh, Vice Chairman. Thank you both uh, for being here. Uh, General McConville, when you were Vice Chief of Staff, you signed an MOU with General Brown at USARPAC, uh, committing at least $100 million in annual funding to address the backlog of infrastructure needs for the Army in Hawaii. We made a bunch of progress over the last couple of years, but this President's budget includes $0 for critical infrastructure improvements in Hawaii. How do you square this MOU with the current president's budget? Well, Senator, we're trying to, we, we have a 10 year plan. As you know, we are uh, building uh, new barracks and, and capability. And then uh, there are some items that if we have the opportunity to pull forward that are on my unfunded priority list. And again, we want to continue uh, to get after uh, those programs. We do have a plan and we're trying to balance the resources we have to bring those to fruition. Do we have your commitment to get us back on track? Uh, yes, you do, Senator. Thank you. Um, I, want you I, I want you to talk for the, for the whole committee, for the staff, for anyone else who's listening about Pacific Pathways, because I think in terms of bang for your buck, there's nothing quite like it in the entire defense budget. We accomplished so much in the Indo-PACOM region for so few dollars, and I'd just like you to talk us through how it works and why it's so inexpensive and why it's so highly leveraged and effective. Yes, yeah, Senator, one of the things I think is really important uh, is building uh, strong relationships with our allies and partners, and that's exactly what Pacific Pathways does. We get to work very, very closely uh, with those who share similar interests. We operate all across the Indo-Pacific. We watch very, very closely. It gets our troops uh, into uh, the various countries that we want to work with. We, have the, we, we get access. We get presence. We also get uh, the ability to influence their training, interoperability, and again, I think, you know, when we talk about peace through strength, having strong allies and partners that work together, that, that train together in a scrimmage, if you will, is what makes us much better when it comes time to actually have to go to combat. Thank you very much. Um, Secretary, um, I want to talk to you a little bit about climate, but I want to divide it into sort of three lines of effort. The first, of course, is that the president's executive order requires all of the uh, uh, branches to um, transform over time their energy systems, transmission, distribution, generation, and fuel. Now, that can't be done instantaneously, and it can't supersede the mission. So that's one sort of bucket. The other is, and I think from the standpoint of readiness, this is the piece that needs to be addressed almost immediately, is you're just going to have increasing severity and frequency 
of severe weather events, both you know, um, domestically and internationally, and we sort of need to contend with that as a strategic question, but also just a, a readiness question in terms of our soldiers getting either too hot or too cold or getting flooded out and all the rest of it. And then the third line of effort is how do we institutionalize these efforts so that the entire Defense Appropriations Subcommittee can get behind this as a national security imperative and not have it swing back and forth depending on who wins whatever election. So the first is the energy piece. The second is severe weather. And the third is how do we institutionalize this? You have a minute. <laughs> Thanks, Senator. I'll try to talk quickly. Uh, you know, on, on the first line of effort, we are working to try to, you know, transform our non-tactical vehicle fleet to be, you know, eventually all electric. We have, I think, the Army has a very aggressive goal on that. Uh, we are even, you know, looking, we're doing some exploration of uh, a hybrid version of the joint light tactical vehicle. That's just an experiment at this point. But we are doing a lot to really... Um, help us with our vehicles. And there are some operational benefits to that as well. You know, quieter vehicles with less fuel requirements means that you don't have the kind of protracted supply convoys. That has, you know, operational benefits on the battlefield. On installations and increasing severe weather events, you know, we have installations all around the country that are affected by whether it's drought, wildfire, or hurricanes. And it has real impacts. And so we are investing in our installations to make them more resilient so that our soldiers can continue to train and can, can train, frankly, in more extreme temperature environments, which unfortunately I think is, you know, going to be the future. Uh, on institutionalizing, I think, you know, that's a great question. And to me, I, I don't know if I have the, the answer other than, you know, I'm, I'm definitely a believer that your budget is your strategy. You know, where you put your money shows what your priorities are. But I think as long as we continue to emphasize the operational value of these types of investments, uh, I would hope that that would build consensus that the department should make those investments uh, regardless of the flavor of administration, if you will. Perfect. And um, one final thought is, you now have senior advisors for climate in each of the service branches, and and each of the service branches are doing really interesting things in the in the energy space. I want to make sure that if you figure out something, that you share you share it with the with the Navy and the Air Force and everybody else. So let's make sure those senior advisor senior advisors and those chiefs and and those secretaries are in a ongoing conversation to sort of elevate and then scale best practices. Absolutely. Thank you, Senator Moran. Chairman, thank you. Uh, Madam Secretary, thank you. I'm anxious to have you as my guest in Kansas at Fort Riley and Fort Leavenworth, and I hope we can find a time to do that. Uh, General McConville, good to see you again. Um, I want to focus on uh, European uh, defense initiative and what it means. I, I heard uh, the chairman ask about end strength uh, earlier in the questioning. Um, we have the 1st Infantry Division, as you know, stationed uh, in Europe. Uh, as part of Atlantic Resolve mission. Uh, the 1st uh, Infantry Division only has two brigades, which takes me back to my uh, constant conversation with you and others. Is the Army looking to increase its presence, uh, as the Army looks to increase its presence in Europe uh, and continues to rely upon a rotational uh, basis, what conversations is the Army having on creating additional uh, brigade combat teams? General. Well, Senator, right now we're, we're not looking at um, increasing brigade combat teams. We're quite frankly, with the, with the end strength we have and, and the size of the Army and the resources, we're looking at holding what we have. We are looking at creating new organizations like the multi-domain task force um, and some of the other enablers, especially with, with mobile um, short range air defense capabilities uh, and some of the, some other type of units, but we are not looking right now at creating additional brigade combat teams. How does the Army plan to uh, use the National Guard's five armored brigades to assist our partners and allies in Europe? Well, the way Senator, uh, first of all, the Guard does incredible things. Uh, we're real proud of them, and uh, what they're doing both at home and away is is just magnificent. We, we don't go to war without them, and quite frankly, we don't do peacetime operations without them. So they are an integral part of uh, the rotations. When we, we look at a, a guard unit, you know, we don't want them rotating other, every other year, but we do, and they want to have a mission out there, and they're part of the team, 
And so they, they will be part of that rotation in the future, just like they're doing right now. What, what kind of training do you envision for uh, our, our Guard and, and uh, Reserve soldiers? Uh, what will they be conducting in regard to our partners and NATO allies? What, what kind of training is the Guard going to be engaged in? Well, if we, we take a look, you know, we have Guard over there right now working uh, with, with our allies and partners. Uh, they are highly trained, and so they're doing, you know, basic combat type training. It could be with javelins, it could be with stingers, it could be uh, with combined arms, basic marksmanship, but they, they run the gamut of the type of training uh, that our allies and partners uh, need. And there's a much bigger emphasis moving right now on logistics and sustainment and maintenance of some of the equipment that we're giving to our, or loaning uh, or allowing our allies and partners to use. Um, in regard to the javelins and other equipment, uh, for us to be fully equipped um, as an army by 2030, the budget calls for transition from development to production for a wide range of aircraft, precision fire, ground vehicles, and missile defense systems. Uh, I've suggested this to the, to the chairman, although I don't uh, know what his reaction was, but that we consider having a hearing in this room uh, for, or perhaps in a classified setting in which we look at supply chain, where we are and our capabilities of providing the necessary equipment uh, to Ukraine and how to make, make certain that uh, uh, we and our allies have the necessary um, technical capabilities through production. Uh, to meet our current demands. Um, the war in Ukraine uh, and, our, and our competition with China has made future production demands for these capabilities even more pronounced. In your opinion, does the Army have sufficient industrial base capacity to su successfully execute and its, modernize its priorities? And how will the Army manage transition from prototype to production? And how will the Army partner with industry to produce these capabilities? Madam Secretary. Senator, I think uh, we do have, I think, um, you know, I'm quite confident in the defense industrial base in terms of it being able to meet our needs with the work that we're doing across our six modernization uh, portfolios. You know, we are certainly working closely with industry to um, work through the supply chain challenges that I think have become very evident during the pandemic. But we have a 15-year organic industrial base plan in the Army just to work on our depots, our arsenals, uh, to make sure that they're able to produce what we need and repair the systems that we're developing. Uh, and I think, you know, in terms of crossing over, if you will, from the development phase into procuring some of the bigger systems that we're working on right now, we are really trying to look very early at affordability issues. You know, the, the sustainment costs, the maintenance, maintenance costs of all of these systems to make sure that we're factoring that in and that we're able to afford it going forward. Uh, so I think we're on a good path, but we're gonna need to continue to have a close dialogue with industry going forward. Um, and, I, and I think in this setting, it, you can't be more concrete than that, and I understand that. I do hope that uh, maybe that uh, if Fort Riley and Fort Leavenworth are insufficient to entice you to come to Kansas, that uh, our defense industrial base would be of interest to you as well. Well, I'm pleased to say I got to Fort Leavenworth. I've not gotten to Fort Riley yet, but I, I was able to go up and see the Combined Arms Center a few weeks ago. It Thank was great. You. Thank you for that visit. Senator Rand, before I go to Senator Shaheen, I just want to tell you that um, we, I just talked to the ranking member, we we're going to have a hearing on supply chain and inventory and classified session. What Mr. power Chairman, you have. Uh, Mr. Chairman, thank you for demonstrating my credibility and power in front of this uh, august audience. Thank you. Senator Shaheen. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you, Madam Secretary and General McConville. Um, I want to start with the question that I asked at the full Armed Services Committee about the ENVGB, the Enhanced Night Vision Goggle Binoculars, because I, I'm still trying to understand how um, you arrived at your decision and um, how, how you can be comfortable that the integrated visual augmentation system, the IVAS system, is going to be able to effectively replace those on the timetable that you're looking at. And, I want to, again, um, point out that today we have Army senior leaders who are going to 
testify in front of the Senate Armed Services Subcommittee on Air Land about the modernization program. And as I'm sure you're aware, uh, the testimony provided to the committee in advance of the hearing um, has Army senior leaders stating that the Army plans to begin conducting operational testing of IVAS in the third quarter of fiscal year 2022. And the plan is to begin fielding the system by the end of the fiscal year. I think that's what you told me in the full committee. Um, so, again, last month, there was an audit by the DOD Inspector General who found that the Army is at risk of wasting up to $21.88 billion in taxpayer funds to field a system that soldiers may not want to use or use as intended. So, if during that operational testing, deficiencies are discovered that would delay or limit the fielding of the system, what's going to be the impact on our forces and, and how, how do you expect to deal with that? Senator Sheen, let me try to address that, um, your concerns uh, more effectively than I did last week. You know, the, the enhanced night vision goggles are a great piece of equipment and our soldiers are very pleased with it, I think. And we have, we have fielded, I believe, you know, um, several brigades worth of those goggles and the soldiers that use them are, are very happy with them. IVAS uh, is, you know, going to be a transformational, really, piece of equipment for our soldiers that provides some of the features that the night vision goggles provide, but also additional features. So, um, you know, we, we really do want to um, move forward on that transformational path, but in, an, in a prudent way. So we are looking to the test that's kicking off this month, and I think we'll go through June, to see how that plays out. Uh, you know, we will want to take the results of that test into consideration as we decide, you know, how how many, how much of IVAS to buy, for example. Uh, but it really is sort of the first wearable technology for our soldiers. So, you know, again, I thought some of the findings in the Inspector General's report were overstated. Uh, and I think um, Assistant Secretary Doug Bush can talk in, in depth about that and uh, I think have a great conversation with you about it. But we are not going to move forward with IVAS if we don't have confidence coming out of that test. So it will be an important milestone. So when the testimony says that you're going to begin fielding the system by the end of the fiscal year, that may not be entirely correct. Well, at this point, as I said uh, last week, you know, we feel good about where we are with IVAS, and I think our sense is, is that the testing is going to prove that the system and some of the kinks that we've been working on with Microsoft are going to be resolved. But if we were surprised, you know, by the test results, we would certainly want to take that into account. But right now, the trajectory that I think I see in front of us is that we are going to move forward with fielding IVAS. And, and is the the testing regimen that's going to occur as um, robust and significant as the testing that you did on the EMVGB? Yes. I mean, we try to test, you know, all, we hold all, all of our equipment to the same types of testing standards. And what's the time tape? How long does it take to run those tests? So uh, I believe this that the test coming, that it would be done. I think in it's less a month long months. test. I think it's a month-long test, and then we'll take some time to look at the results of that test. Um, well, I look forward to hearing more about it because, as I said, I continue to share, to have real concerns about what's being proposed. Um, I, I would like to just, if I can, Mr. Chairman, uh, ask another question that may run over because when you're talking about the recruiting goals and the challenges with recruiting, how have you factored in what's happening with the workforce more broadly nationwide? Uh, certainly rising wages, you know, while a great thing for Americans, are a challenge that we're facing. Uh, so, you know, that we are looking at, again, things like recruiting incentives, you know, the $50,000 bonus for certain MOSs. Uh, we, are, we have just put out a new marketing campaign called Know Your Army that tries to um, inform young Americans of all of the benefits of joining the Army, not just in terms of salaries, but also um, paid leave, you know, the possibility of retiring at a, at a relatively young age, help with buying mortgages. So I think part of what we need to do is better communicate the value 
uh, the, the benefits, if you will, but also the intangible you know, sense of purpose that I think the Army can give for a lot of people to pursue you know, their passions and challenges. Um, I certainly agree. I think that's really important. I would argue that one of the problems that our military is experiencing is the same problem that industries across this country are experiencing, and that is we have a lower birth rate, so we have fewer people entering the workforce, and we've had the most restrictive immigration policies in this country's history for the last five years, and that that's had a huge impact on workforce. And Mr. Chairman, I know nobody wants to talk about it, but what we need is a comprehensive immigration policy that is going to address this. Thank you. No argument here. Uh, Senator Murkowski. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Madam Secretary General, welcome. Uh, Madam Secretary, thank you for, for being there in Alaska. We appreciate that, uh, that focus, particularly on the uh, very troubling issue of, of mental health and the rising level of suicides that we have seen throughout the Army and particularly uh, up north. So appreciate your attention to that, and I'll have a question uh, in that vein. But let me begin by uh, raising the issue of your number one uh, item listed on your unfunded priorities. Uh, this is a new multi-purpose physical fitness facility. We're kind of viewing it as, as an Arctic field house of sorts. Um, I think we recognize that, that focusing on uh, morale, focusing on readiness, uh, especially in a region that is very cold and and oftentimes very dark for much of the much of the year, but it is it is kind of a standout figure there. Ninety nine million dollars for the facility is is striking. So, can you just provide to the committee, um, first of all, why you feel that this is the number one on your unfunded priority list, and and really why is it so? Why is the price tag so high? Um, know that I'm going to argue for it, but I think it helps us to have a better understanding as to what exactly is required uh, in, um, in the interior there. I just was going to have General McConville Perfect. address it, since it's the chief's unfunded list, maybe, and I can Please. add if you like. General? Well, we'll, we'll, we'll start on the first of all, um, you know, our troops' presence in Alaska is extremely important for national security, and um, at the same time, uh, as you know, much better than I do, is it's a challenging uh, climate for our troops up there. We want to give them the ability to uh, be able to work out and, and have a physical fitness center that allows them to um, participate uh, in activities uh, 365 days a year, regardless of the weather. We've talked to the commanders up there and said, what can we do to help you? And this is what their priority was, and that's why it sits as my number one priority. I think we have to do something. We have a, you know, a a challenge on behavior health out there. And when we talked to commanders, they said that's what's needed. And I think the cost is just because where it's at. You know, right. it's, it's very, it's challenging. Prices are going up and, you know, we'd rather put the, the price, that's what they say it's gonna cost to build the facility that we need. And we wanna be able to do that. And Thank I would you. just add that, it, you know, if I'm not mistaken, I think the fitness center is also, it's going to be relatively large because there has to be an indoor track. You know, we've got to have a track that our soldiers can train for the new combat fitness test. And so that coupled with the, the high costs of material and construction is part of the price tag issue. Well, I appreciate you putting that on the record. We recognize that for, for so much of the year, it really is not safe to be training um, when it's 40 below uh, that. That's a little bit tough if you're trying to do, um, do miles. When, when we're, we're talking about the Arctic and, and training in the Arctic, um, you, know, you have uh, announced just last week uh, before the um, Armed Services Committee very welcome news, which we appreciate. And that is the reestablishment of the 11th Airborne Division. I think this is great news. I think it's already bringing energy to our troops. Uh, we, 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 we're watching daily um, as the kind of bulking up NATO's east flank continues uh, with Russia, but we can't take our eyes off the fact that we have a western flank, we have a northern flank, and they all come together in the Arctic in, in Alaska. So welcome news. It's a great announcement. 
Part of my responsibility on this Appropriations Committee, though, is to make sure that we are able to fund this transformation. Can, can you uh, inform the committee what actually will happen then uh, to the strikers that are currently assigned to the 125th, uh, whether or not they're going to go away, what the status is of the cold weather all-terrain vehicles, because again, that's going to be an investment. Um, and then when you, when you transform from an administrative to an operational headquarters, what might this mean in terms of, of resources and, and, and in terms of troops? So what we want to know is how we can help facilitate this in a manner that works best. Certainly, Senator. Uh let me try to take that in turn. We're, we're very pleased about uh, being able to reflag U.S. Army Alaska as the 11th Airborne Division. Uh, there won't be costs immediately associated uh, with that particular step. We are looking at potentially taking the strikers out of uh, out of Alaska, and you know, if we we have not made a final decision about that, uh, but if we do that, we will basically you know take them um, and look at the ones that we can reuse elsewhere or, you know, basically use for parts. Um, and then what will, because a striker unit has a larger number of personnel associated with it, we will use those spaces to be able to increase the size of the headquarters to go from an administrative headquarters to an operational headquarters. Um, so really from a manning perspective, if you will, it will be about neutral. Uh, and we would be looking at basically having that division headquarters have sort of the same types of capabilities that you see in the 173rd in Italy, for example. So I think there, you know, but we won't need to do, you know, new military construction, for example, to house people uh, at this time. So I don't think that these changes are going to have large price tags, but we will be continuing to put money in the budget for things like the Cat Vs, for example. Good. Well, I appreciate that, and, and please let us know how we can help with, uh, with a, again, a transformation that I think is quite significant. And I think we recognize that this is going to help with the, uh, with the mental health, the behavioral health issues that, uh, that we have spoken about um, when we were able to, to discuss the plan to, to surge mental health resources to Alaska in the immediate and then in the near term. So let us know again what it is that we need to do to resource that because we know you just can't surge it up for six months and then take those resources away and expect all to be well in the world. My time it has expired. Uh, I do want to ask though, about why Arctic and cold weather gear continues to be on the unfunded uh, list rather than in the base budget. It, 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 I'm just reminded that we've got a, a battalion from the 425 that is jumping into uh, Arctic Norway this week. And so when you think about what is happening on the ground right now, what Alaska can offer, what the Arctic force is that we need, you got to have the gear too. So hopefully we can, we can address the Arctic gear needs as well. Thanks for watching, and if you haven't already, please consider subscribing to our channel. And while you're at it, please leave us a comment. Thank you for watching.